Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll start on time. And thank you so much for um, making the time to join us today. We're going to have other people trickling in as well. So welcome to everybody. Um, Wow, so today's Friday at 12 o'clock. We're going to start the session. Um, welcome to the um, Ascolite Learning Design um, Special Interest Group. Myself and Kashmira, Dave, will be presenting and hosting the webinar today. Um, just a bit of shameless plug for us as well in our Ascolite conference coming up. We've got um, a fantastic conference up in um, Armadale at the moment coming up in the next couple of weeks, and it's a blended uh conference there's going to be um, on campus and also virtual as well and that's coming up fantastic program and there's also a range of special interest groups as well that's going to also have run a few activities there so before we start um, I do want to acknowledge um, of country as well I come here to respect and share knowledge with all of you and our ancestors and as we gather for this webinar physically dispersed and virtually constructed. Um, let us take a moment to reflect the meaning of place and also in doing so recognize the various traditional lands on which we are gathered here today. And um, for me, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, um, the traditional owners of the land where I'm residing at the moment. I would like to acknowledge the elders past and present and emerging of all lands um, that we work and live on their ancestral um, periods. And I pay a lot of uh, gratitude and respect as well. And feel free to acknowledge um, your respects as well within the chat area. So Ascolite is a, for those of you who don't know, we are a, a non-for-profit professional association um, across Australia and um, uh, close by as well in the Asia Pacific area. We are engaged in um, the educational use of technology in the tertiary education area. Ascolite runs a lot of special interest group and learning design is such a important area in the area that we are developing in the tertiary education space and there's a range of other special interest groups as well on offer. For us in learning design, uh, Kashmir and I has you know, just recently taken over the leadership of the group as well. We are planning a lot of activities coming up in 2022 with regular um, monthly webinars, reading groups, doing a bit of podcasting and also hands on um, activities with um, unpacking wicked problems or problems that within our community wants to solve. So we have over 300 members. We do have an MS Teams uh, digital collaborative space as well that we want to build community. So it's a, net, it's a place to network with other academics, developers, learning designers who are interested in learning design. And we're here to provide that platform to share and curate our knowledge as well in that space. Um, for us at the moment, um, feel free to also engage with the chat area. We also um, have a Padlet board as well, a Padlet space as well. So what we want to do with our webinar, our topics, we are looking for um, speakers in this space as well. And we're, we, we welcome all in, the, in terms of the topics within learning design. What we want to do is um, we want a Padlet board um, for each of the topics that are coming out. So anybody across the community can curate and add in um, their thoughts and share their um, ideas in this space. So for now, we want to welcome our two um, fantastic speakers today. We have Anu Kara and Nikki Donald from Torrance University. Both are senior learning experience designers um, in this space and it's such a relevant topic at the moment as we move towards the fourth industrial revolution move towards we're actually in that at the moment um, and really aligning that with experiential learning and how do we go about designing that and looking at some examples and this is a real for me I'm, I'm quite excited about this presentation because one of the key things with us in this group we've got so many learning designers who are um, practitioners in that space um, we've got examples that is going to be presented, um, some actually real examples as well as projects emerge in this um, space by Nikki and Anu. Um, so really excited to actually welcome both Nikki and Anu as well. Um, so without further ado, what I want to do is pass it on to Nikki and Anu. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you very much. Um, Bujari Kamarua, hello everyone. Anu and I would like to start today's session by acknowledging and paying respects to the traditional owners of the lands from which we're presenting. I'm joining you from Gadigal land and Anu from Ghana land. We extend our respects to elders past, present and emerging and to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here today. 
Over to you, Anu. Thanks, Nikki. And um, thank you, Kashmira and Leon, for this initiative. And thank you, everyone, for this opportunity to share our knowledge with you around 4IR and how experiential learning can help students to develop some of the skill sets to flourish in the world where changes are happening at a tremendous speed and scale. Um, I'll share some of the ways we are bringing experiential learning into our subjects. And then my colleague Nikki will present a project that she's been working on that explores a new technology that has emerged from 4IR and is having a big impact on education. So the fourth industrial revolution is a term um, coined in 2016 by Professor Klaus Schwab, but it's only recently that it has become a part of my vocabulary. So I start my day saying good morning to my Google Assistant, and in response, she gives me a weather report and the daily news briefings, and by then, I'm ready to get out of the bed. Perfect. One day I had a fight with my partner and I thought of asking my Google assistant on how to deal with that fight. I shared the entire story with her and in response, she started reading out from this web page, which gave me suggestions such as try to see things from my partner's perspective. Hmm. Conclusion, she kind of got the gist of what I was talking about and found some useful links for me. That's sweet. But in that moment, I needed a friend who would understand who I am as a person and tell me what, that I was right. So far, artificial intelligence still lacks emotional capability that would sync with its superior deductive reasoning, problem solving, and planning skills. However, as we speak, researchers continue to enhance AI with greater thought capability and are trying to train them in working with human emotions. There are predictions on how AI will change some of the existing jobs and how some of them will completely disappear and the new jobs created may be radically different. A lot of working class um, jobs typically taken by young people with lower academic achievement are increasingly disappearing in our technology driven world. And it will only deepen the divide between those who achieve a great start in life and those who don't. So the question is, how can we prepare our graduates for a digitally transformed world where it is difficult to predict what tomorrow brings? It's a very big conversation, but in the context of this webinar, we would like to share some ideas that might help in preparing our graduates for the jobs of tomorrow. So recently at Torrance University, um, we launched this book that explores core themes of the fourth industrial revolution highlighting the digital transformation that has been occurring in society and business. The book also reports the findings of collaborative research studies on the potential impact of 4IR on labor markets, occupations, future workforce competencies and skills associated with industry sector in, sectors in Australia. So one idea is to refer to these findings while we are designing our courses related to a particular industry and ask some specific questions around 4IR technology to our industry partners during the course design process. However, one thing we need to keep in mind is that we still don't know how different societal, economic, political, environmental conditions would intervene to interrupt, regulate, or circumvent the introduction and adoption of new technologies. And three of such conditions that this book lists are infrastructure access and equal in access and quality, government policies, and industry labor um, regulations in Australia. And this makes sense because it's uh, it's so important to ensure that technological progress will will work for the benefit of the society and not against it. Um, another idea is to look into the reports being published by some of these companies around uh, future of work and skills to make sure we are providing enough opportunities to our students during their course to develop the necessary skills required by the future workforce. And as an example, I wish to share this taxonomy that Accenture has come up with. It's called New Skills Now. It has six underpinning skills families. So learn to earn, build a tech know-how, apply VQ instead of IQ, create and solve, cultivate a growth mindset, and specialize for work. 
that are required in the digital economy. So cultivate a growth mindset is that, as you can see, is the linchpin that connects all the six skill families. And this attribute is going to be very important in future and it will enable our graduates to stay relevant, continuously learn and grow and adapt to change. Now let's just look at one of those skills family. So create and solve. And you'll see that they have listed um, the skills under foundational, medium and master. Um, so the skills like decision making, judgment, logical reasoning. Sorry, I don't know what happened to the <laughs> To the presentation. Oops. Sorry. So to provide opportunities to our graduates to develop some of these skills, um, like the, the ones mentioned here, we can use Kolb's uh, experiential learning theory to create activities and resources within the subjects. And um, I wish to share some of the ways that we do that in, in our university and I have created a poster to showcase that. Um, I'll just bring that up. And this poster is also available um, on the Padlet that Leanne was talking about. So um, I've just listed uh, the, some of the theories that we've considered while, while we designed this poster. Uh, it's not going to the next page, the two pages actually. Ah, oh, there you go. Thank you. Uh, so we use branching scenarios I don't know what happened. Sorry, so we're using branching scenarios that simulate real life practice um, and enable our students to self-identify gaps in their knowledge through reflection and feedback. So that's one way. Another way is dramatized videos that give them experience of the situations they are most likely to encounter in the real life. These can be used to develop competencies and behavior that would promote alignment between um, the personal and work values. Another way is um, digital storytelling that helps them develop their creativity and also their digital literacy and research skills. Another way is poster presentation that helps, engage, helps them engage in deep learning while researching the topic of their poster. And there's one digital games that can help in developing decision-making skills. So you can have a look at this poster in detail later. It's uh, shared on the Padlet. And um, I'd like to hand over to Nikki, who will present a project that uh, utilizes fourth industrial revolution technology with experiential learning to develop some of these skills that I've just discussed. Over to you, Nikki. Thanks. Thanks so much, Anu. And thank you for that great insight into um, 4IR. Um, I have to confess that I am um, a bit of a tech geek <laughs> from way back. Um, and let me see, you wouldn't think so because I can't even get the slides to share at the moment. But <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, yeah, I am actually a tech geek. Um, EdTech ed is the main focus of my master's program, which is in um, education, innovation and change. So I'm really excited by the potential that 4IR brings to really elevate and augment our teaching and learning practices. So what I'd like to share with you all today is a learning experience that I've personally had over the past 12 months working as the senior learning experience designer on the development of a virtual online hotel using extended reality. But before I go any further, I would just like to invite you to share what you know or what you understand the term extended reality to mean, because I didn't actually know what it was 12 months ago. So feel free to jot down your ideas on the screen or if you want to pop something into the chat, that would be great as well. Um, I'm very keen to connect with learning experience designers who have worked in this space or would like to work in this space. 
Um, I think the fourth industrial revolution is really having, a, well, you can probably see that already, having a really disruptive um, impact on education. And um, the technology that I'm going to be presenting today is going to be used more and more um, in the very near future. And I know a lot of uh, higher education providers and, you know, like even schools and high schools are using VR already. So um, we need to look at how that is going to be impacting our learning experience design practice. So I can't see the chat, but um, yeah, someone's just popped something in there. Is it more than augmented reality? Does it present possible futures? Oh yeah, we have many possibilities in the future. Um, I think Forbes actually sum it up really well. Um, extended reality is an umbrella term for immersive technology, such as augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, and I'm going to throw the, the new buzzword out there at the moment into the mix as well, the metaverse. So these technologies extend our reality by either blending virtual and real world. So remember Pokemon Go? Um, so blending virtual and real worlds or through full immersion, um, which is achieved through a headset. Um, or you can do it on your laptop or your desktop. Um, you know, you've seen kids playing games or, you know, like even maybe your partners and adults playing games as well. So it's all that type of thing. And, and now this is really impacting um, what, we, what we're doing in education. So um, the project I've been working on is being designed for use on um, laptops and desktops, and we are now transferring it over to be used on VR goggles early next year, which is really exciting. So the students can have a full 360 immersive experience. Before I go any further, um, I want to just give a massive shout out to the amazing team of people I've been working with the last 12 months on this project. Um, Ashley Howard Kerr and the team at the Blue Mountains International Hotel Management School, Elise Maloney, Kaveh Haider, Ka uh, Carlos Ortega, Tom Kerr and Sari Talhami. We've been creating the virtual hotel for the undergrad students at the Blue Mountains International Hotel Management School using this really exciting technology. And our aim is to redefine the student learning experience for both practical applied skills and skills such as empathy, conflict resolution and customer service, which are essential for the hospitality industry. Um, the Hilton Hotel actually use virtual reality to teach empathy to their staff. So when this project kicked off with a brainstorming session on a whiteboard uh, in December 2020, I had zero experience with these technologies, let alone um, designing learning experiences for them. And unfortunately, as much as I tried, I couldn't find or connect with any other learning experience designers who had had um, experience in this space. So I launched myself into some serious crash research, which included game design, um, I did a short course on Udemy. Um, I devoured literature on extended and virtual reality and its implications on learning. And of course, I had to invest in a set of VR goggles purely for research purposes. Um, again, if you want to throw your comments into the chat, um, I would love to know if anyone has had experience designing in this space. And if so, we really need to connect. Um, that's okay, we don't need to go to that slide again. Um, we, we, re we really need to connect. I'm actually really keen to set up a, um, a special interest group or a community of practice for learning experience designers and, you know, like other academics who may be interested because um, I really think we need to um, connect, support each other, start sharing ideas, maybe, you know, like creating a framework. Um, so if you're interested, it's, um, I'm again doing a bit of a shameless plug, I'd really love to get something off the ground. Um, so one of the things that was really top of mind is, you know, we know the fourth industrial revolution is really disrupting education at all levels and we're going to see technology in many different forms being used in education and more. And I can take over the slides from here, thanks. Um, so one of the things that was really top of mind for me, and I'm sure that's the same for all of you learning experience designers out there, how do we ensure that the technology doesn't override the learning? So uh, this was one of my key concerns with the virtual hotel design. 
Um, I had no guiding framework for the learning design. I've had to develop this along the way and a lot of it has come out of mistakes that I've made. We've got, I think we've got a little AI bug in our um, presentation today because it seems to be, have a life of its own, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so um, first and foremost, I came up with um, a digital pedagogy. So the digital pedagogy is a combination of experiential learning constructivism and serious game theory. So um, serious games are, are, they're like games, but they have um, an educational um, focus. So uh, extended and virtual reality is uh, really, um, truly experiential and learner-centered. Although I have a funny feeling Cole wasn't thinking of virtual reality in mind when he came up with the theory. So I just love how this is, um, translated through the um, through the decades. Students actively participate in and have full agency over their learning as they control the environment and how they interact with it. We have designed various tasks. Oh, we've lost the slides again. We've designed various tasks um, that occur within the space and these are followed up by um, when the students have these experiences, these are followed up by reflection opportunities and they can be done within the space, um, such as interacting with some cool little quizzes that we've created and knowledge checks. Um, they can be done outside of the space, so students could get involved in discussion forums um, or even doing some reflective journaling about the experiences that they've been through in the space. And finally, of course, they can um, have some great discussions in their, um, in, their, in their classrooms. So as the students conceptualize and create meaning from the um, experiences that they've had, they can apply these within the virtual hotel, which is a really safe, risk-free environment. And that builds their confidence for when they move on to practicing their skills in the real world. Um, now, this technology is actually used quite a lot in industry. So industry where there are um, high risk situations that could potentially occur, firefighters are getting trained now using virtual reality with the full headsets, um, people that are going to work in the mining industry, um, and it's really big in um, the medical industry and healthcare as well. So um, the other thing that was really important was utilising um, SEMAR and TPAC framework theories to identify when the technology would not be appropriate. So it's really tempting to look at all the cool things that you can do and then just have the whole learning experience overwhelmed by these bells and whistles. So um, it was really, really top of mind for us to make sure that the pedagogy became, came before the technology. The technology is there to augment the learning, not to override it. And it meant that we had to let go of some of the initial ideas that we had, which was a bit painful on my behalf, but um, ultimately the learning experience is a lot stronger for it. And finally, we utilized um, design thinking as a methodology, and this really underpins um, all um, my approach to learning design in general, um, and that really helped me manage the, the learning experience um, design process. So a combination of all of these factors has resulted in a fairly robust learning design framework for extended reality. Um, this includes some templates that I've shared on the Padlet, and I'm going to show those to you in a minute. Um, and I'll show you how they work and how they've translated um, into one of the scenarios that we've developed. We've ended up with nine virtual reality experiences. So the VR experiences are teaching students those really um, industry um, soft skills such as empathy building, conflict resolution, decision making, observational skills, customer service. And then we've also developed um, using another type of um, XR technology called 360 um, experiences. And we've got five of those. And these are all about building industry knowledge. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a sec. And I'm going to take you to the Padlet. Um, and I will show you where the template is. And, and please feel free to use this. Um, OK, prepare to go into the vortex for a quick minute. <laughs> And OK, is my screen sharing? OK, can everybody see or can anybody, someone give me a shout out to make sure you can see the Padlet OK? Yes, all good. Fabulous. OK, so this is the Padlet that um, Leanne was referring to before. Um, and I've uploaded um, the guidelines that I've created for learning experiences for extended and virtual reality. 
Um, yeah, this isn't um, a mandated framework, obviously. It's just a culmination of everything that I've learned. And I've actually been able to pass this on um, to the uh, for the new project that is currently underway that we are designing for. It's a, a virtual fashion design showroom. So I've been able to um, upskill um, and a learning experience designer in my team and he's actually used this and, and kind of customised it to suit the project. And this is what I would really love you guys to do as well. So, you know, like if you think it, it would be valuable. So the first page is all about how to use the template. So it's like how to actually approach the project. And, you know, when this first came to me, I was going, I was thinking to myself, where do I even start? You know, like I don't even know where to start. So um, we started off doing a resource gathering exercise. And I, if you have your design thinking hat on, that would be the empathy phase. So we met with the team up in the Blue Mountains. We went up there, I think we were up there for a total of four days, and we met with each of the individual learning facilitators for about 90 minutes each. And we started doing this resource gathering exercise. So um, the template is where we record um, the, the conversations and the discussion. It becomes the roadmap for the XR experience. So it captures the learning experiences it defines the environment and the scenarios that occur within the environment. It's very, very high level. Um, you list all of the objects and, that you want the users to interact with. Um, any avatars, which are like your 3D characters, um, they could even be, I guess, compared to an online learning facilitator um, or a guide. Um, so you can define um, the characters that you want in the space. And then when this is complete, um, we have a meeting with our developer and we run through our resource uh, gathering template with him. It's like a bit of a wish list and we say to him, okay, what, what is possible? What's, what are we being? Are we absolutely crazy? Can you do this? Some of the things that I thought we could never do, um, he did and it's <laughs> been quite extraordinary. So then once that has been determined, the developer goes and starts developing and then we start working on the scenario development. So this is where you really get into the detail of the learning experience, define the narrative, the sequence of events that occurs within all of the scenes, and every single action the user undertakes, the quizzes that they will be um, interacting with, the objects, um, the videos that you might, because you can put videos in these spaces as well. So, you know, like anything that you can think of that will really bring that space to life and really create that engagement. The other information on this sheet is um, just some, the research and I guess the key learnings that I have gathered from my experience. Um, when I was doing the research into serious game theory, I, I came across this concept called an engagement loop and it's very much like Kolb's experiential learning actually. So this is how we motivate people within the virtual environments. So, you know, how do we motivate them? What are we, what challenges are we providing them to, you know, get them to act within that space? And, you know, like how do we encourage them to um, create that or, or to undertake that action? And what kind of feedback are they getting along the way to, you know, like advise them, hey, you're doing the right thing, or no, you need to try that again, or even encouraging them to keep going. So I provided that there because I just thought that was like a, a great little um, a piece of inspiration. These are the development tips um, that I've gathered from um, conversations with game developers and the program director for um, our, our game design course here at Torrance as well. Gave some really great insight. Um, I'm not going to read all those out, but I've just recorded those um, for you guys to have a look at. Um, and also provided some resources here. I found these really, really useful when I was um, starting the learning design strategy and thinking about, oh God, you know, where do I look? Where, where do I start? So there's some things in there as well. I recommend just start playing some online games and, you know, look at all the different types of interact interactions and artifacts and things that can um, occur within those environments. Finally, a really, really great tip. Um, don't build everything from scratch. It takes ages. Um, there is a really fantastic asset store that you can buy pre-made models for pretty much everything. Um, we've actually just bought a model for a sewing machine and an iron um, for, the, for the design studio. 
because we can customize them and it's just a lot more um, faster and um, efficient. So I've got the link to that there as well. So just really quickly, um, resource gathering template, um, the way that you would use this and if anybody wants to dig into it in a little more detail at any point, really happy to, um, to touch base and connect. Um, what I've done here is at the top, that's where you put the subject lead, um, subject matter expert or your senior learning facilitator. What is the student experience? What are the learning outcomes and what are the assessment tasks that will be connected to the experience? And in yellow, because this is very important, consider how the activities in the XR or VR experience relate to the subject content, the subject learning outcomes and support the assessment tasks. Okay, so it's all about the technology supporting the learning, augmenting it, not overriding it. How will the facilitator use this in their teaching strategy? And then we just go through, and this is almost like a brainstorm. So, you know, we ask the learning facilitators, what is the learning experiences that the students will have within the environment? So the environment, which is, we call it a scene, is a hotel, yeah? So these are all the different learning experiences. I mean, there could be many more than that. It just depends on, you know, like how big you want to make it. So this is obviously all about um, learning to be a hotel guest agent and learning to do things like dealing with an angry guest. So if we go over to the scenario, so the scene, this is all in a hotel and the scenario within the hotel is actually in the lobby. Um, and of course, if you wanna use this template, you can just delete all of these and put your own details in, but I've just put them and left them there for examples. So in the hotel lobby, the guest credit card is declined and they get angry. What is the appropriate response? So these would all be the types of things that um, would be taught in the in the curriculum. So we're just, you know, moving it into this niche. And then we've d identified some avatars that um, would need to be in the space as well. So we'd need an elderly man, that's who we've identified as being the angry guest um, in casual dress and the objects that would be interacted with. So the hotel booking system, the credit card and a card reader. And these are the things that our developer would have to create. And then um, we've defined um, at the end of that scenario, is there a quiz or a knowledge check? For this one, there's a drag and drop quiz. And something that is really important is sound, especially if you're doing like a full immersive space. So sound is really important because it helps set the scene. Um, it helps create the atmosphere. So for the hotel and some of the scenarios we've created, we've got kind of like soft background chatter. Um, we've got music in one of them. Um, and the other thing with sound is that um, the other type of sound that we've used are indicators um, when students have completed tasks. So they'll get like a little ding when, when a task has been completed. And of course you can have sounds, you know, like if they do something incorrectly. So really up to you, but these were things that you know, like I learned along the way that I wouldn't have known um, to kind of consider. And then finally, what do you want the space to look like? This is really important. Um, so you've got to think about the architecture, the environment that the students are going to be in. One of the key tips that I learned was make sure the ceilings are really, really high. So if you've ever had any experience with VR goggles, um, you'll notice a lot of them don't even have ceilings. It's just sky, or if they do have ceilings, it's really, really high and there's lots of light. Because if you've got those goggles on, um, it can feel very claustrophobic if it's very dark and enclosed. So for a learning experience, we want it to be really big and open and airy. And you can have a look at the, um, the asset store for some ideas around that. So we pass this on to our developer. He says, yes, we can do everything, hopefully. And then you start working in the scenario development phase. And again, I just like to have all of these details about the student experience, learning outcomes, assessments. I need to have that there. That is my focus, okay? That's where I come back to every time I, you know, like I check in, you know, are these scenarios supporting these learning outcomes? So now we start developing the scene a bit more. So this scene is in the hotel room. And what is the learner doing? They're dealing with items that have left be been left behind by a guest. And these are the actions. So it's really, really detailed. The first action is 
they enter the room and actually we um, we did another one they have to knock on the door first as well so they have to knock on the door they have to turn on the lights they have to hook the door lock and an avatar um, will greet them give them an overview as to what they're meant to be doing and these are the objects that they um, will be interacting with so after they've gone through those actions they go into action two then they go into action three and when they've completed action three, they'll get um, a quiz to interact with. So, you know, how do they respond? It's, I guess, a little bit like a branching scenario. So they respond to um, the questions and choose the correct answer. And then, of course, they'll have the tones to indicate, um, well, you can have tones to indicate interactive objects. We've done it visually. Um, you can have an AI voice for your quiz question if you want to have that as well for your quiz questions and responses um, and then tones to indicate if there's a, a right or a wrong answer. Okay, and then you can do, and you just keep adding them. And then the final action is they need to leave the room and they need to make sure they turn off the lights and unhook the door. Um, yeah, and then you just keep building and building like that. So again, this is the template I've shared with you. Um, this is an example and then there's a blank uh, version if you wanted to use it. All right, so um, I'd love to show you now what we actually um, developed and I'm just going to give you a little quick insight into one of the scenarios. So I'm going to flick over here. Can everybody um, see the start screen or do I need to reshare? We can see it. Fantastic. Okay. So this is the entry into um, the housekeeping subject. This is a room quality check scenario. The really cool thing about this is the students access this via their LMS. So the LMS we use is Blackboard and we use um, um, an LTI to actually connect uh, Blackboard into this space. So they all the students do is click on a link and they end up on this landing page. The landing page, this is really important as well, has information about how to navigate through the space. So they can use these keys or these keys to move forward and backwards and around, drag your mouse to look around um, and how to pick up objects and things like that. So make sure you've got instructions uh, for your users and then click on the start. And you can see in the top left hand corner up there, we've got um, a task bar. So there are 12 of them. And we've got an instruction here that actually tells us um, what to do. So we need to start by picking up the checklist from the top of the card. Okay, so I walk over here, I'm just pressing the forward arrow key. And this is a checklist of all of the different things that I need to work through. And I can press my space bar to close and open. Okay, and so I go over here. Can you hear the sound okay? Did you hear the little knock on the door? Yep. I don't know if you did or not, but yep. there's, yeah. The door opens, okay. And then I turn on the lights and I get a little cute little bell ringing to say I've done the right thing. I'm just going through this quite quickly because I've done it a million times. <laughs> but if I bring up my list again, you can see I've um, done three of the tasks already. I don't have to do them in that order. I can do them in any order. Um, open the wardrobe and what do I have to do? I need to check there are 12 hangers and they need to be tidy. So if you had a headset, um, there we go, from 2022, you can actually be in this room and be fully immersed in this space, which has been so beautifully designed um, by our developer. Um, open the mini fridge. There's some old milk in there. I need to take it out. Okay, have a little look at it. Yep, okay, need to take that out to the trolley and dispose of it. And then I need to make sure I choose the right um, bucket to put it in because one is for linen and one is for trash. So I need to make sure I choose the right one. Oops, I don't want to close the door. Back in. Oops, I forgot the milk. I need to go back out. <laughs> need to get the new milk. Replace that. Okay, 
Okay, check the catalyst clean. There's so many cool things to interact with in here. Yep, all good. Replace it. Um, remove the first page. It had some writing on it. Put the pen back. Another thing I need to do is check behind the curtain to see if there are any uh, anything left behind. There's a bit of rubbish there, so take that back out. Put it in the right bucket. Pick up a towel because I've got to replace the towel in the bathroom. And then there's a dirty one on the floor I need to pick up as well. So the students can do this whenever they want and just get really, you know, like me now, I know exactly what I need to do. So um, Ashley, if you're listening, um, hopefully I've passed this subject. <laughs> I'm pretty good at room quality checks. I can turn the lamp on and off, check that that's working. That one's not working, so I have to re uh, have to place a maintenance call. Uh, so Nikki, just sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, we have a question that can you can you take the trolley inside the room rather than just going every time? Um, no, back? and this is something that is um, as a housekeeping attendant, you don't actually take the trolley in the room; you leave it out there. Because we did have it in the room initially. So yeah, thanks for that question. Um, okay, so I've done everything except turn on the TV and set it to the hotel compendium channel. This is very cute. I think it's very clever. So you turn on the TV, it's a bit staticky. So you click again, and then you've got a nice compendium channel. And we are done. Our hotel is being nice and tidy and clean for the guests for when they return. And then we just have to do the last couple of things. Unhook the door, turn off the light, close the door, and we are done. Well done. You have managed to complete all of the tasks associated with a room quality check. How did you find the experience? Were there any surprises? It's important to take the time to check every task. Efficiency is also key when performing room quality checks. We recommend you come back to practice as often as you like to increase your efficiency so that when you do a room quality check in a real life hotel, it will almost feel like second nature. Um, and that's it. So we, um, with our avatars, we wanted to give it a real international feel because it's international hotel management. So um, each of the um, characters or the avatars within the spaces uh, or in, within the different hotel divisions um, have quite distinct characters and we've also given them a bit of personality so when you first meet them it might be like hey I'm Mario and I'm the head chef and I've been you know in the industry for like 25 years and I'm going to take you through the kitchen like that type of thing um, so yeah look I, I hope that um, sharing this experience um, will help any of you that um, are working or planning to work um, in XR in your own practices um, and also I would love to hear any feedback from anyone who has done this type of thing before and exchange ideas and experiences um, yeah so thank you so much for your time oh goodness me that that was very overwhelming I, I must admit and <laughs> I, I um, I think everybody else will say that as well. Uh, thank you so much, both of both of you. It is fantastic, and um, uh, I, I keep seeing those questions. They're saying um, uh, this is a huge amount of work. Very cool. So, have you started to evaluate this? For example, how this supported long-term uh, retention skills, or how does this relate to the real life? What is the student engagement long term and intermediate and uh, any negative effects on especially on uh, with the dizziness? <laughs> so that's the first question. I have so many, but I will just let um, our audience ask questions first. 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, look, thank you very much for that question. Um, it is a really good one. We haven't released this to the students yet, so we are now at testing phase. And so our next step with this is to give it to the senior learning experience designers and the team in the, at the Blue Mountains um, School. And for the next um, few weeks, they're going to go through and test everything and trial it. And um, then, of course, you know, following on from design thinking methodology, we'll take that feedback, implement it, and then we'll have it for ready for release for the students um, in 2022. So yeah, look, um, it's something that we will be look, watching very, very closely. Um, I've read some really promising research around the impacts of um, VR on student learning and retention. And I think one of the, the most positive things that has come out of it has been that the fact the students feel very empowered because they are learning at their own pace and they can do it whenever they want. And so, you know, they can go into these environments and, and really immerse themselves in it. And if they make a mistake, there's no one there to laugh at them. You know, there's no one there to, well, not that anyone would, but you know, like you don't feel self-conscious. It's like you can do this, you know, really quickly. You can do it really slowly. You can take your time. You can go back and do it again and again. Um, so the research that I ha have read is being promising, but it's still a really, really new field. And this is um, why I'm interested to connect with people and, and talk about it and see how it's going to impact our, our learning experience design. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Nikki. Um, we have another question from Ewan. Uh, she's asking, how are you dealing with accessibility, visual flagging and things like uh, uh, color blindness, cognitive load, et cetera, and sound, et cetera? Yeah, another good question. Um, accessibility we've covered pretty well because we have um, we have sound, we have voice for everything, um, and we also have the the visual as well. Um, yeah, color blindness. That's a really good one. I hadn't actually thought of that. Um, it would be really interesting to get that feedback if there. Are, I might ask Ashley if any of her team if they're comfortable in identifying as being color blind if it has any impact on them. Um, yeah, but yeah, so Lee says, I recall you mentioned this, enable students to immerse themselves and give them the experience of being in the space. Yeah, so the cognitive overload, um, I don't think that would be so much of an issue because the students can kind of come in and out of this whenever they want. And this, the scenes are actually quite, quite short. That was a long one. But there are some that are quite short, so that we've been mindful of that as well. And we, a lot, and some of the other scenes as well, we do a little um, activity and then we stop, and there's a little quiz that they that they answer. So there's that time to kind of stop and reflect as well. And as I said, they they control this, so they um, um, they can manage it. Yeah. So, so Nikki, can I just ask, uh, would it be a different experience if they wear those uh, VR glasses than doing it on desktop? Would it be a different yeah, environment for them? Yeah, absolutely. With the, with the goggles, I, um, I should have brought mine. They're just sitting over there, actually. But with a headset, um, yeah, you're fully immersed in it. So everywhere you look, you're in that space. And then you have these handsets um, that you hold onto, these little controllers. And then um, you can click on things with the controllers. Um, so yeah, it's really different. It's quite quite extraordinary. And I think that um, the main thing to consider if you're going to be using the goggles, keep the um, the scenes pretty short because I had them on the first time I got mine. I had them on for two hours, and I wasn't very well <laughs> when I came out. But I had a really great time. But um, I wasn't feeling particularly well when I came out. So probably about 20 minutes max would be recommended um, from what I've read. Um, but even shorter, just so they can kind of, yeah, manage that. Someone mentioned something about dizziness. And, yeah, there have been there have been reports of people feeling dizzy from these experiences. I know the technology is becoming more and more advanced and the, the Oculus um, goggles that I've got have something inbuilt to address that. But I think there are people that will you know if you're a little bit prone to you know like car sickness and seasickness you might experience that but you can um you can engage with this on your desktop you know if you prefer so it's up to you so 
Uh, just one more question, um, Nikki. Um, is there any opportunity for students to be collaborative group based learning experience in this approach? Sorry, can you repeat that again? Is there so is there any opportunity for students to come in at the same time and have some collaborative experience? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yes, definitely. And that's something that we want to look into in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, this is all based on gaming. So this is, it's like, um, so it's called serious games when you're designing for education. Um, and absolutely, you can invite other people in to collaborate. Um, one of my um, very innovative and um, inspiring teammates, Carlos, has actually created this virtual environment. Well, there's a platform that he um, has subscribed to and his team actually jump in as avatars and have little meetings in this virtual space. He, he um, showed it to me yesterday and it's amazing. So look, that's out there already. Um, we, we were probably, we're just gonna trial this first and then we'll start adding the capabilities because now we've got this beautiful um, space set up. We can just keep building on it and building on it and building on it. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's lots of opportunities for scalability as well, which is really great. Yeah. Nikki, I have a question. Like uh, I'm, I'm going back to your uh, beginning of your presentation where you uh, talked about design uh, thinking and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, empathy stage. Now, that uh, that stage, you have to identify uh, the stakeholders. And I know that like, because we are working in a higher education institution, so students are the, the center and our all actions and uh, uh, you know everything that we do is around the student engagement. But apart from that, there are, um, uh, were there any other consideration about the stakeholder and um, the capabilities and uh, communication um, to them and seeking their kind of like a empathy into the project? Um, absolutely, that was um, something that was really, really important to us, that um, it was a collaboration um, with our stakeholders and the team um, product innovation that I'm in. Um, so we worked really closely with the team. Um, it wouldn't have come together without their without their commitment and their participation. Um, mm -hmm. We had, um, so Ashley Houdker, who um, I mentioned a little bit earlier, she was our kind of our key contact. Um, so we would meet every week, um, we'd you know, check in, see how the, the progress was going. She would liaise with her team when they were developing the scripts and the different scenarios and things like that. So it was very, very collaborative. Everything that we've designed has been driven by um, what their what their goals are and what their needs are and considering their pain points um, for teaching students that are you know offshore and unable to come you know like face to face so yeah it was collaborative like that's that's the only way that I'd want to work so I mean I know that that this is a uh, in in the, uh, the the trial phase at the moment and it's not been yet implemented but uh, in the end this whole experience will be um, taught or introduced by the academics uh, to their students, isn't it? So yeah. would, did, did you need to have some kind of orientation for them um, on how to use it and how to kind of like uh, um, rationalize uh, these ideas and, and present that to the student as a valuable experience for them? Yes, absolutely. We are going to be releasing this to the academics on the 26th um, of November and there will be like a, an orientation session. Um, a few weeks ago I had a workshop with the um, senior learning facilitators where I did put that question out there. I was like, okay guys, you know, we're getting close to the release phase. We need to think about how this is going to be implemented into the sessions. So um, hopefully they've been like beavering away with that in the background while we've been finishing it up. But yeah, it's absolutely mm -hmm. essential that um, you put that into your development process, into your project process, have that time for the orientation with all of the facilitators, um, you know, go through it with them, show them how it's going to augment the, the teaching and the learning, get them really comfortable with it. Um, you know, get their feedback. Um, yeah. It's really important that everyone is included, absolutely. So I think just being mindful of the time, uh, now the next question is for Anu. Um, Anu, have, um, uh, do you have any other comments about developing students' capability? Yeah, I was just um, replying. Learning to, experience. I was just replying to Leanne, but yeah, I can speak about that. 
um, one thing to keep in mind while um, even designing using experiential learning theory, it's not just about doing things, but it's uh, more about reflecting on what, you know, what the students are doing, asking them to reflect and getting feedback. And that's how they learn. So we have been, we have been putting experiential learning even in the assessments as well, where we give them opportunities to reflect on uh, their experiences and improve on making better decisions yeah so that's fantastic and other question um uh, is is related to that i know you or nikki either of you can answer it. what uh, so it was co-created with the students so did you um, like seek any feedback or uh, the in any involvement from the students in this whole process not at this point, but when we release it in 2022, it will almost be like a soft launch. So we want to be gathering that feedback, that student mm -hmm. feedback along the way. That's um, definitely a big focus. Yeah. And re really good point, Catherine. Yeah. So um, any anyone else has any question um, before we close? Uh, well, no? I just wanted to say it would be great to hear from you guys on um, if you have any other ways of, you know, bringing fourth industrial revolution into your uh, subjects as in, you know, yeah. share that with us on the Padlet. It would be great to yeah. have conversation yeah. going around that. So just for everybody's interest, I, I just want to mention that the Padlet will be open for anyone. I mean, uh, regardless to whether you have attended this seminar or not. The recording of this uh, webinar will be available um, uh, to Ask Light and our Learning Design SIG page. Um, you can keep going, visiting, um, and uh, you know, curating this uh, um, um, Padlet, and uh, you will see that uh, people will keep posting things in there. So just thank you for attending and keep collaborating. And um, thank you, Leanne, for all the work. So do you want to say a few words uh, before we close, Leanne? I just want to say a huge thank you to Nikki and um, Anu for um, giving up your time today to share your fantastic work. And I think one of the key things, you know, um, in seminars or webinars that we take part in, I think it's great to present, you know, updated topics, but really sharing your framework, I think that's somewhere, and it's being acknowledged in the chat area as well, for those who are interested to hit the ground running. And we're so thankful for, you know, your team to actually share this as well. And I think this is um, a relatively emerging space going forward. And um, we are keen to connect with each other. Learning design is a key area. We're in a community. Um, and I'm sure, Nikki, you've said this and I knew at the same time, and your brilliant team down at Torrance University leading the way in this space. Um, so we are keen to continue the conversation going forward as well to connect with each other and share good practices in that space um, going forward. So really uh, a round of applause to both of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to present today. Well done. <laughs> Well done. Um, and anybody who has participated and not being part of Learning Design SIG, I, I would just invite you to come and join us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Have a great weekend. Okay.